Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Miss Angla's biology class. I am Miss Angla, and in today's video, we are going to be looking at a genetic exam question. This one is a little bit more tricky. It's based off of a hemophilia pedigree diagram. I'm going to walk you through how to interpret the diagram as well as how to answer the questions for full marks. If you are new here, don't forget to subscribe and like this video and make sure your notifications are on so that you receive the freshest content every Tuesday. Tuesday and Thursday. And if you are in matric and you're looking for extra help and you want to get that distinction at the end of the year, you should think about joining my membership. I have exclusive members only videos. We do live lessons and you'll have access to my summary notes. It's at this point in the video that if you want to attempt the questions, pause the video now before we run through the questions. So let's get into breaking down this question. Now, the question says that the pedigree diagram below shows the inheritance of hemophilia in a family. And the allele that causes hemophilia is a allele found on the X, small h, and the normal allele is X, big H. Now, what they're expecting you to know here is two things. One, they expect you to know that hemophilia is sex-linked, and the clue that this is sex-linked is because it's on the X chromosome. And the second thing that they expect you to know is that it is recessive, which is what they've shown over here, where we have the lowercase h. And they expect you to know that. Um, sometimes they won't even give you this information in uh, exams. They want you to know this already, and you will need to provide these alleles without being prompted. Now, my advice to all matrics, whether you are an A student or a D student, um, and you're getting 80% or you're getting 40 and 30%, is that you always need to go through your pedigree diagram and fill in every single person's set of alleles. Now, you probably think, wow, that's really time consuming, but you've got to see the bigger picture. If you make sure that you understand the pedigree diagram well, and you go through and you fill in everybody's alleles, you will reduce the chances of you making a mistake later on, especially when you are looking for people's genotypes and you're trying to explain how they've inherited it. So my advice to everybody when you do a pedigree is to go through every individual. And the first thing you're going to do is you need to decide, is this a sex-linked cross or is this an autosomal cross? Now, this is a sex-linked cross, which means you can go through to each person, uh, male and female, and you can insert the X's and the Y's next to each person so that at least you already know who is male and who is female. I want to quickly fill that in now before we continue. Now I've gone in and I've added everybody's sex chromosomes, X and Y for male and XX for female. Now what we need to do is we need to go through this family tree and fill in the obvious people first, the easy ones first, and then we will work our way backward and fill in all of the missing pieces. Now, first things first, the easy thing to go around and fill in is all of these hemophiliac males, because in order to be a hemophiliac male, you only need one receptor of allele because you only have one X, so that's all you can offer. So that means that all of these males that are colored in, so these are these um, squares that are colored in black, they each have a lowercase h on all of their Xs, right? And they were really easy to fill in. Then we have this one female down here, number 14. Now she has hemophilia, and the only way that that's possible is if she has two lowercase h's on each one. Um, and yes, it is unusual to see a hemophiliac female in a pedigree diagram, but I want you to know that these are hypothetical um, examples. So you just roll with it. Even though your textbook might say hemophiliac females aren't born, you're just going to roll with the question and you're going to work with it as you see it. Now, going back to all the males that are not um, infected or affected by hemophilia, they need to have a capital H on their X. Because they don't have a backup H, they have to. So if they're not affected, every male that's a square here that's not colored in should have a capital H on their X. And I'm just going to fill it in quickly on all of them. 
Right, now that we've done that for all the males, let's do the females. And the females are a little bit more tricky because they can be carriers of hemophilia, which means they don't have hemophilia, they are normal. However, they are carrying a recessive allele for it. Now, to determine these types of things, we need to look at sometimes the offspring, and then we can calculate what mom and dad are. Now, for example, if we look at individual number two, the mom at the top here, she doesn't have hemophilia. She's not colored in, which means that a at least one of her X's has a capital H on it. Now, what about her other X? Well, now let's look at her children, okay? She has two sons uh, that have hemophilia, which is six and seven. Now, the only way that that is possible is if they inherited a small H from their mother because uh, if they're boys, they only get Ys from their dad. So that means that her other um, X must carry a lowercase h on it, the recessive allele. Um, now let's look at her daughter, number four. Number four gets one X from mom and one X from dad. Now the only X that she can get from dad carries a capital H, right? Now her other X, and this is interesting. She can either get a capital H from her mom or she could get this other lowercase h. Now, the only way to know what is her other letter is to look now at her children. And already I can see that her child number eight and child number nine both have hemophilia. And the only way that's possible is, remember, if you're a boy, you get your Y from your dad and your X from your mom. The only way that they can get a lowercase h is if they get it from their mother, which means their other X comes from their mom with a recessive allele. Now, likewise with girl number 11, she's going to have a capital H because she doesn't have it. Now, this is a tricky one for number 11 because she could have a recessive allele um, from her mother. Or if you actually look here, she could have a capital H from dad and a capital H from mom. We don't know because she hasn't had any children. And the same can be said for individual 12. She could also have a capital H, capital H, or she could have two uh, capital H and a lowercase h. But remember, they haven't had children, so we can't determine that. Now that we've filled all of this out, we can now look at our questions and answer them accurately. So here we see the phenotype of individual four. So here is individual four. We know that pheno means physical and she is a normal female. She doesn't have hemophilia. The second question says the genotype of individual two and conveniently we have already calculated it so we can write that down. Then it goes on to say, explain why females have a smaller chance of suffering from hemophilia, and this is for three marks. Now, when you are describing these kinds of answers, please, grade 12s, do not talk about males. Do not say that males have this, and this is why they get it more. That's what we call answering in the negative. You need to only talk about females. So you're going to say for the three marks, first of all, what is a female's sex genotype? She is XX. So she has two Xs. And in order for her to have the disorder, she would need the recessive allele on both her Xs. Because if she only has it on one, the dominant allele will mask the recessive allele. So you get one mark for saying that she's got two X's. You get one mark for saying that the recessive allele must be on both. And you get one mark for saying that a dominant allele will mask the recessive allele if it's present. Now, the final question says represent a genetic cross. So we're going to do a whole genetic cross with P1 and F1 and all of the Punnett squares and the pheno and genotypes. And we're going to calculate the percentage chance of individuals 13 and 14 having a hemophiliac son. And so at the very end of this, you must make sure that you provide the percentage. And this is the percentage chance of having a hemophiliac Son. Now I'm going to show you what that looks like now in the memo. Now here is the memo as we discussed, but I want to just bring your attention to the Punnett square and the genetic cross at the bottom here and how we actually um, plan it all out. Now, as you can see here, we've got the basics, we've got the P1, we've got the parental generation, we've got their uh, genotype, um, we then write gametes, and we put our gametes down, and we put our Punnett square, and you'll see you get one mark for each of those. 
Um, and then you'll notice at the bottom here, we are doing the pheno and genotype. And specifically, there's something called a compulsory mark here, which means that you have to get this right. Otherwise, you can't get seven out of seven. You'll just get six. And so when we do the calculations, as you can see here, we've got two females that are normal. Okay, they don't have the disorder. And then we have two males that do have the disorder. So when we do the genotype and the phenotype, we need to provide a percentage. Specifically, the question is asking for the phenotype percentage. And in this example, there is a 50% chance of there being a hemophiliac son, or two out of five. Remember, we don't want to leave it as a fraction. We want to make it a percent. Now, for those of you who are new to these kinds of memos, I just want to bring your attention to this bottom bit over here. You see it says you get one mark for saying P1 and F1 and 1 for meiosis and fertilization. That's what they mean um, over here with these like curly brackets. Those are saying together you get a tick for each of them. But in this particular question, you can get a maximum of six for the working out. But the one compulsory mark is this one down here, giving us the percentage chance. Now, if you'd like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. And I will see you all again soon. Bye.